This is Travis. Travis, you're up next. Hello. Hey, Bart. How's it going? How's it going, Travis? Got a hand for us? Good. Yeah, can you hear me all right? I can. I can hear you. And I was saying to the okay. guys out there, Travis, uh, we've been trying to get you on for a while now, right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I've been uh, out of town the last couple of weekends, so it's been it's been tough. But thanks for, for bearing with my schedule. No problem. So where is this played out of? All right. So this hand uh, was in at the San Antonio Poker Palace. Uh, it's oh. a 10-25 game that they're now running uh, every Friday night. Um, this was my first time playing it. Um, I, I don't play that often. Uh, and so I typically play the, the one, three game down there. Um, but I figured I'd give this one a try to, to see, I'd watched it. They streamed the game. So I'd watched the stream a couple times and it seemed, you know, like a, a game I could probably play in and do all right. This San Antonio poker palace place. I'm pretty sure this is owned by the same guys that owned the Austin poker palace and i forget the guy's name he's a little chubby dude or big no he's not a little dude he's a big guy yeah rich rich right is that his name rich yeah yeah i've seen rich that, on that is his name yeah richard yeah. or rich yeah. right right i've seen rich on different live streams and i think he moved his club to san antonio and then there was another club that took over that space in austin that was nice that didn't survive because these clubs are like I think it was called the Palms or something like that. I played on a live stream and then it changed names to like the Red Lodge and then that place closed down. But anyways, obviously there's a lot of games in San Antonio. I'm surprised. That sounds I'm, right. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised they're playing 1025. So 1025, no limit. Okay. Uh, and this is very early on in the session. I'm uh, probably one of the least experienced players there. Everybody there seems like a reg. They all seem to know each other. I know at least a few of the guys there are, you know, play for a living. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is early on in the session, maybe hand seven, something like that. Okay. Uh, and I uh, uh, wake up under the gun with Ace of Hearts, King of Hearts. So, and how deep are you? I'm the effective stack at 46, 4650, yeah. 4650 effective, okay. Ace, King of Hearts under the gun, and you raised to how much? Uh, I raised to 100. Okay, to 100. So, 4X, is that about the standard? Uh, it's certainly standard for me, you know, if I'm raising under the gun to go to 4x um okay and uh uh yeah so so that's all i know okay so you go to 100 the hijack calls okay and then it folds around to the small blind who raises to 500 a small blind three bets to 500 so under the gun you go to 100 hijack calls small blind to 500 so he's actually using decent sizing from out of position and you say you're 4650 effective, so I assume the small blind at least, or you have him covered, or he has you covered. I mean, here's the thing. I mean, it's kind of an interesting setup because you said that you usually play one three, so you know maybe you're taking a shot. I don't know how much, how experienced you are in a game of this size. Was this one of the largest games that you had played ever? This this is the largest game okay. I've played ever. Yes. So, I mean, you kind of want to four bet here. You kind of want to four bet to gain yourself and drive the hijack out of the hand so that you have position over the entire hand. And you do have suited ace king. So you are incentivized to four bet. With that being said, I mean, we're human. And I could see a situation maybe in my career where all of a sudden somehow I was stepping like five steps up in a game and I decided to call. You know, the game was very, very huge. I decided to call. I've got a suited hand. It doesn't play the worst multi-way so i can see calling here in this setup i'm just saying that you are incentivized to four bet your call obviously too because the small buy made it 500 it, it, there's no guarantee that the hijack is going to call behind like if you went 100 small blind went to like 250 or small blind went to 300 then i think it would be a mandatory four bet but there's going to be times when you call and the hijack is going to fold out so there's that too um what did you do i'm just i don't i don't even remember what happened but did you call I, I did end up calling and I was I was thinking about it afterward because I was like, man, I think I would typically four bet there. Mm -hmm. um, and for some reason, I I felt pretty certain that the hijack was going to fold. And I'm not sure exactly why I thought that. I don't know if he was holding his his cards up or something like he was motioning to fold or or maybe I this is a guy I've watched a few times and he just didn't seem like the type to to double flat or um, but, but for some reason, I know that was in my head and I think that played into it, but I think you're right. I think, I mean, I think typically I probably would play this as a four bet and that, that makes sense that I should, uh, but I did end up calling. And what did the hijack do? He folded. All right. So hijack folds. All right. So that's good for you then. I mean, you don't have the betting lead, but at least you're not taking this in yeah. the middle, which is much, much harder because obviously if you're in the middle, 
um, it's going to be much harder to, to realize your equity. Like here, you can call on flops where you miss, especially with any type of backdoor, but you can't really do that. Uh, you know, if there was a guy behind you, basically. So it's like 1100 and change to go to the flop. Okay, what's the flop? The flop is three of spades, two of clubs, six of hearts. So six of hearts, three of spades, two of clubs. This is a pretty good example, actually, of that, where it's a rainbow flop. You got a backdoor heart draw. You have the nut, no pair. You know, it's a low board. You are obviously should continue to a bet here. I think it's mandatory. But if that guy was in there behind you and this guy bet, it would be pretty difficult to the point where you probably should fold off. But I, but now I'm going to be continuing here a ton. What did the small blind do? So he bets 350. Okay, so 350, so small sizing. And I assume you called? I did. Okay, so Hero makes... So here makes the call. Pretty standard stuff here. Now we're off 1,800. Six of hearts, three of spades, deuce of clubs. Okay, what's the turn? The four of hearts. Hmm. Six of hearts, three of spades, deuce of clubs, four of hearts. So now you've got... It puts a one-liner out there to a five, which is interesting because you start thinking about, well, how many five... Like, if it gets checked to you... And I don't even know what happens. I'm just kind of thinking ahead like a chess game. Like if it got checked to me here, would I start bluffing? Now, you do beat some other ace highs, but could you bluff off an over pair? And I think my thinking here would be, I think I probably would start. I, wait, I don't even know if it's going to get checked to you. I'm just kind of thinking if it gets checked to me, would I start a bluff here? You would you would want to start bluffing the, the, the hands that, had work showdown value like ace 10 ace jack more than ace king but i think i still probably would bluff uh ace king of hearts here but the thing is is that you'd have to bet twice and then i'd have to think about how credibly am i representing can i have a five here like am i call am i opening and calling with ace five suited maybe i mean maybe the question is am i opening and calling with fives and what i find interesting about that is that we think about that in our spot but is our opponent necessarily thinking about that um, to that level? And also, too, if I was your opponent, I would be pretty concerned here because if you went bet bet on turn and on river, you know, I'm only beating hands that you're turning into a bluff. Obviously, I'm jumping ahead here. I don't even know what happened, but I, I just think it's an interesting scenario. Did the small blind check? He did not. He bet out um, for 1580. Okay, damn. Oh, well, all right. Well, anyway, so he bets fifteen eighty. Yeah. What is that? That's bizarre. Yeah, that's that was my that was my thought. Fifteen eighty. Hmm. And so I was I was kind of confused. Um, I was I was thinking, you know, well, that card should be better for me, I think, um, since he was the pre flop uh, three better, and I I just called. Um, uh-huh. and I, and I was, it was such a, it was a smaller sizing on the flop. I mean, that I, I was just, I was very confused by, right. And there's one other piece of information that I, that at least affected me at the time, whether or not it should have, I don't know. But this guy had said to me before he was kind of, you know, joking around with me and, and poking fun at the fact that I didn't play a lot. He goes, oh, you look like a guy who watches a lot of YouTube poker. And I was like, yeah, I was like, no, I don't, which is untrue. I do. But, uh, uh, and so to me, I got the sense that he might be trying to push me around. Um, and so, and I, there was a little bit of me that was kind of like, well, fuck this guy. Well, 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 well let me give you my take here too. And so let me give you, let, let me give you my take before you decide. Cause I, I want to look at, I'm going to try to think about stack sizes here and what's left. So first thing I'm going to do here is look at my stack size and look at the pot size. If you were to call, the pot would be just just under five thousand, and it you know you'd only have I mean you put in five eight twenty four so you'd only have about twenty twenty two left. If you were to call, it would be five thousand twenty two left. So if you were to shove, it would be like seventy two hundred twenty two to call. So he'd be getting incredible pot odds. So it's kind of interesting because I you know I looked at this. I'm, I'm trying to think about. You know, is somebody ever going super, super thin where they just think, like, let's put ourselves in our opponent in the hero's, the caller's 
opponent spot. And we know maybe we just don't think this guy ever plays up this big. And it's not even necessarily a bluff. We're just not concerned that he ever has a five. And we have like aces or kings. Does the board really scare us that much? I mean, it's a pretty extreme configuration here. So does the board scare us this much? So would could we ever be taking this type of sizing for value with some sort of hand like that? Now, I tend to think, though, that if our opponent thinks that this guy doesn't play at this level, it seems a little bit more bluffy. And if we are the hero and we block aces and kings, which even makes it less likely that he's doing something crazy like that super thin, then it kind of tends to make it it, it does kind of make it look very, very bluffy. The weird part of this hand, though, is is that if your opponent is bluffing, you have him absolutely crushed. Like, and what I mean by that is, is like if he's bluffing with, you know, ace nine suited or king queen suited, you know, king queen suited with the back door or something like that, you basically have him drawing dead. Now. Here's the problem, though. If you were to just call, and now the pot's already, you know, now the pot's about 5,000 and you've got 2,200 left, and then the river's a brick, and then he shoves, are you going to forget to call at the end? So there's a, there's a number of weird things going on here because of the stack sizes, because let's just make the assumption that if your opponent is betting any hand for value here, even though I don't think there's much, he's not folding because of the pot odds. Meaning if he's betting like queen, queen, and you jam and it's 7,200 and it's 2,000 for him to call, he's still not folding. He just thinks that maybe you're going with like eights or nines because you never have a five here. So let's just make that assumption. Then is there a reason to ever shove? Now, is there ever a hand that your opponent might do this with that would fold? Like ace four, ace three, something like that. I would tend to doubt it. So <laughs> it's a weird, weird little tricky spot because I feel like you have, if he doesn't have a pair, he's almost drawing dead. But if you call and miss, are you ever giving him the opportunity to bluff you? Or are you just going to go call, call? Because I think you can get into a spot here where you might call and then not call at the end. And I'm not talking about always call, depending on different runouts. But if I was in your spot and I looked at this situation and I thought to myself, I'm going to go with this hand no matter what, I might play it as a call call, as a, as crazy as that sounds. Instead of shoving now, I might just call call. Now, that makes the assumption, like I said, that there's no fold equity against a hand that he's betting for value, even though I don't think he's betting much for value. That's why it's such a weird spot, because I think it's so polarized on the turn, working through that, that there really isn't necessarily a reason to raise. So it's it's pretty cl it's pretty close. Now, if someone say, well, he's monkey betting pocket nines and he'll fold to my race, then obviously you could just jam. But anyways, so what, 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 th those are my thoughts. And, and so I did not have all those thoughts during the hand, though I had them afterwards, which is the reason that I, I submitted the hand, because I feel like what I did was not the right choice. Um, I, I did end up jamming uh, for 3,800. And, and looking back, on, and I think my thought at the time was, I kind of had some of those thoughts about, well, you know, if he's, if he's, you know, betting with eight, eight, maybe I can get that off. I was like, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So maybe he's bluffing, not even thinking about the fact, and this is what I thought about afterwards, exactly like you said, well, if he is bluffing, then this is a call call. But am I, like you said, am I going to be able to make that river call? And I, ugh, I, I think I probably, I, I, I don't know whether I would have been able to do that. You know, like I said, it's the first time in this big game. Um, I, I don't know. So I, I did end up jamming. Um, but I think for the reasons you said, I think it's, it probably wasn't the right move that if I wanted to go with this hand, probably best to, to just call him and call. Cause yeah, you're right. He's not going to be, when I, when I presented this to my friends, um, you know, one of them said, look, this, this feels like he's got like Jack, Jack or queen, queen. Uh, and they said, what you say, he's like, he's not going to fold that. He goes, so I would just fold. So he would just, who, who would just fold? Oh, you mean that your opponent would just fold, you mean? 
Uh, my my buddies, no, yeah, yeah, my yeah, my, you know, my buddies were telling me to fold this hand on the turn because they they both thought he had, you know, um, uh, they said, you know, if he's if he's betting for value, he's not going to fold it. He probably has jacks or queens or something like that here. But I, but but anyway, so so I did jam. So you did you did jam, um, okay. and uh -huh. he ended up folding. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <sighs> what buddy you're talking about said to fold your hand because I mean, you can't fold your hand. It's never a fold. You block aces and Kings. Now I know some people in the live chat were saying like, Oh, Jack's or something. I, I, I don't buy that. Like I said, I mean, I go back, I, I sort of went on this whole spiel, even before we thought we knew what you had, where the only thing that makes any sense to me for someone for value would be super thin. You're, you're blocking aces. Like if the guy was just like, this guy never has a five. So then it really, and then you block Kings, but you have ace king of hearts, so you can't fold because there's always going to be that added possibility that he's bluffing. Plus, you have the backdoor. How can you possibly fold on the turn to 1580 with the nut flush on two overs? Uh, I, I just don't think that that's the play. I, I, I mean, I don't think jamming is terrible. It's just one of these situations where you could get into a spot where you might forget to call on the river. That's why it's so interesting. I mean, obviously, you didn't, it didn't. You never found out what the guy had, right? I mean, it doesn't really matter. I did actually, because wow. this was it was supposed to, it was supposed to be a stream game, um, but but it, because of technical difficulties, it wasn't. But the app was working at the time, so I was able to go back look at the the app that they had us use for the table, uh, and found out he had seven of clubs, eight of clubs, seven of clubs, eight of clubs. Uh huh. Seven of clubs, eight of clubs. So. I mean, it's one of these things where, um, so he turned a gut shot. I mean, I don't know if he would have bluffed at the end or what. I mean, I guess you give him a, I mean, here's the other reason to jam too. I mean, you could make a case for some equity protection here as well. You could make some a case for some equity protection here as well, where if he's not going to bluff on the river, no matter what, if you just call, then you give him a free shot at two cards. But I mean, again, like there's, there, there's just not you, because you have hearts covered, um, he's almost drawn dead, but even so, even still, if he still only has six or seven outs and he's not going to bluff the river, then you're just giving him a free shot. So I could, I can kind of get on board too, sometimes with a little bit of jamming here for equity protection as well. So interesting hand. I appreciate the call. Thank you very much. 